All right, so we are going to talk about <clears throat> bitwise operators and uh, this is what it's going to be. <clears throat> first of all, when you're dealing with bitwise operators, the very first thing you to do, you have to quickly draw the, the, like even if you get a question in the, in the final assessment about bitwise operators and stuff, I'll try to provide, because it's on a paper, I will provide you the table. But at any moment or time you're dealing with, bit, with, with bitwise operators, this is what you do. Immediately you go, yep, I've done it over there on the, on the, um, I've done it on the, um, this is not blocking anyone, is it? Are you okay? Because <laughs> he's the, all right. <laughs> Uh, okay, should I do it like this too? Is it better now? Okay. All right. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then go one, two, one, two. And then zero one 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 zero one. So what we have right now over here is a quick translation between binary and hexadecimal. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so if you see a code like this, a uh, binary pattern like this, and you want to translate it to uh, hexadecimal, what, all you need to do is to do this. Okay, so you have two zeros over here, and there you go. 1001, 1001, that's a 9. 0110, 0, 0, 0110, that's a 6. Again, 9 and 1. So this is hexadecimal 1969, okay? And at any moment you get a dump of memory, that's what you get to convert it back to binary if you need to, to see what is the mask or set something like that. Immediately, whatever number that you get, so you get uh, X, uh, F, A, 3, 2. As soon as you get something like this, then you expand it like that, so 2 is, Zero one zero zero three is one one zero zero a is zero one zero one and f is one two three four so that's the binary representation of that one are we good okay so that's how you convert between hexadecimal and binary quickly okay so next Everything's integer. We don't have anything but integers when you're doing binary. It's Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra only deals with zeros and ones. There are no partial stuff of any kind or anything. Is recording, right? Yeah. So because of that fact, you need to uh, um, understand that we are, and, and the only thing that you have is addition. There is no other thing. You don't have something minus something else. There is no such a thing. Everything happens using adding two things together. If you want to add uh, 2 and 2, it's add. If you want to reduce 10 by 2, you're adding minus 2 to 10. Okay? So everything is adding. Remember that. Okay? Number two. How do we keep negative numbers? Negative numbers are kept as positive number in, in two's complement, which means if I have the number, say, uh, 3f, if I have something like this, and that's a positive number, how do I know it's positive number? f is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 3 is 1, 1, 0, 0. Because the, less, the left bit over here is 0, this is a positive number, okay? Now, if I want to reduce this by, say, uh, x, say, what do I do, 1, 2, if I have something like that, 
if it's minus x12, what you do first, you write the positive one. So the positive x12 is what? 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 0, 0, 0, right? First, you flip all the bits. So all the bits are flipped. Now I have 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, right? And then you add 1 to it. So this becomes 1 plus 1 is 1 plus 1 is right? And it goes 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Right? So this is minus this number. To reduce the value, you simply uh, you reduce that one by this one. And so you add the two, and then you have. So that's how it happens. That's two's complement. We don't want to talk about that. It just, it, it just you know, you never want to do stuff like that. Dividing by two and multiplying by two are very important actions. Multiplying a number by two is essentially left shifting the, the value. Dividing it by two is right shifting it. Okay, what is a left shift? What is a right shift? Left shift is this. So if I have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, uh, 4, and this. Okay, if I want to left shift, it's essentially this. You go 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and then a 0 is inserted at right. This is left shift. This is left shift one byte, one bit. So left shift, that's the thing. So if you want to left shift a value by one, that's the thing. So the insertion operator that we had for O stream, that's actually left shift that is overloaded to do all those good stuff that you're hearing. Okay? So you're left shifting. Right shift is a completely different ball game. So left shifting is always that. There is no problem with it. Okay? Right shifting, you have to always take a look at the left bit before you do right shift. So if I have right shift, if I want to right shift this one, if I want to right shift this one, what happens is that, uh, so let's actually make it like this one. So this is one. Let's say this is one. Okay? Let's say that is one. When I left shift, you see I lose that one over there. So that goes what they call it bit pocket. It goes to garbage. It's lost. That's when, when you see something like that overflow happened. Something got multiplied by two, and it lost its value because it was too big, the value that it came out. Okay? So that's why you lost the one. If it was zero over there, life was beautiful. You had no problem. Okay? Um, or even if it changed up, it all depends. But just let's, uh, I'm going to go it one by one. When you are right shifting, the story is completely different. If I right shift this value, that's the result. So I right shift everything because this one is, first you right shift, which means you drop the zero over here and it goes again back to what it was, one, 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 zero, one, one, zero. And then you copy the left shift over here. Okay? That, it's, it's very simple. Okay? If you right shift this one, you have to ask a question. If your left bit is one, you have to ask a question. Is this a signed integer or an unsigned integer? If it's an unsigned integer, so if this value, if this value is an unsigned, un, I haven't written for years, so sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know. Un, Unsigned. Unsigned. Okay. If this is unsigned, you right shift and you fill the left. So, so if I right shift this one, it's gonna be one one zero one one zero one, and then a zero is inserted over here. But if it's a signed integer, if that value is a signed integer, okay. You right shift, so the right shift happens, as uh, that is uh, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Then you look at the 
thing that you have over there. Oh, uh, one. Um, is that correct? One, two, three. Yeah, and then you see what you have. What was the last bit? You copy that one. Okay? Why do we do that? Why we right sh when we right shift? Why do we fill the left one with the value of the of the uh, the left bit? The reason is that when you divide a negative number by two, the result is negative. Correct? So you have to keep that value to keep that as a negative value. And a division by two is a right shift. A, div a, 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 a multiplication by two is a left shift. Are we OK with this? Are we OK? Are we OK? <laughs> All right. All right. Can I ask you some probably dumb question? No, there is no dumb question. Um, if it is signed integer, I know signed um, from A to F, uh, when it is hexadecimal value, when you see A to F, it's, it means that, that minus to, value. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you are doing right shifting, when you are doing right shifting, you have to ask yourself, is this thing signed or unsigned? If it's unsigned, you don't care. You just right shift and put a zero. You don't care. Left shift, you put a zero. OK? Right shift, left shift. For sign integer, no problem. The empty one is always 0. When you have a signed integer, then you have to think. So the only exception is when you have a signed and a right shift that you have to fill it with uh, 1 only if the thing is 1. That's all. For the rest of the stuff, it remains the same. OK? Yes? Um, so if you write, like, say, like 99, right, binary? Mm -hmm. 99? Yeah. 99 is base 10. First make it, by 99 you mean x99? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Nine, 99 in hexadecimal yeah. is 9 plus 9 sixteens. Where 99 in decimal is 9 plus 9 tenths. So they are completely different values. So what about like just writing the number 9 in binary? What is the one you, like, what is the one you write the nine in OK, 9 in binary is easy because it's the same thing as, as so. So 9 in binary is this, if it's a character. Oh, okay. If it's a short integer, I have to add 8 more. If it's a regular 32-bit integer, I have to add 16 more. If it's a 64-bit integer, I have to add another 32 bits. That's why I'm going with a byte. I don't want to keep writing 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 64 of them over there. OK? All right? I don't want to go to IPC 144 or whatever, ULI 101. When, they, when do they teach you to convert from between types? ULI. So I don't want to go there. I don't want to convert between types. It's just my concern is only bitwise operators, and that's all. And to know bitwise operators, these are the basic things you need to do. OK? So bitwise operations, what are they? Bitwise operations are. Left shift, OK? Right shift. So left shift. Right shift, OK? Or and exclusive or oh, exclusive or you do not have this one in logical ones. So. It's, it, it doesn't exist, does not exist. So this uh, does not exist in logical operators. The rest they do, OK? And not. OK? So 
This is tilde, the, the one that you do for the destructors, okay? That's not an N, it's a tilde, okay? Um, sorry, my handwriting is not the best. <laughs> All right, so left shift, right shift, or an exclusive or a not. And what all these things do, they affect the bits inside the integer that you're dealing with. They don't take the whole thing as a value, which means 3 and 4, sorry, and what is the, if I say over here, A is set to 3 and 4. Seriously, I can't write. Four. Okay, if I do something like this, what do I have in A? What is the value of A? What is the value of A? What is true? No. What is true in C language? Or in C++. No, what is it? What is the value? If you print it with C... Thank you! This is 1. A becomes 1. It becomes true. Remember, IPC 144, when C is telling you true, it's always 1. When C is examining truth or falsehood, anything is true but 0. So a condition if it's non-zero, it's true. But the result of a logical operator is always either one or zero. Okay? We've done this. If you were in OP24, probably I, I, I used and instead of an if statement. You can do stuff with lazy evaluation. We did all that. Remember that? No, you don't? No? You're writing if statements using and. Instead of writing if, you write an and statement. Three people are doing this, but anyways. So, and the rest are like, what are you, well, we'll, we'll maybe talk about it. So, apart from that, what, what happens if I do this? Three and four. Then I have to see what is three and four. So, three is one, one, zero, 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 and four is... Zero, zero, one, zero, 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 correct? Correct? Now let's end it. One and zero? So this will be zero. Got it? Got it? So the AND happens between, through the corresponding bits, where the logical AND deals with the, the whole value. Logical AND is not aware of any bits. Logical AND only deals with the variable and its entire value, where bitwise operators only deal with the bits inside the integer value that you have. Are you okay? Are you okay down to here? All right. So that's and. What happens if I say A is 3 or 4? That's or. How do I write or? 4. <laughs> okay. If I say A is set to 3 or 4, the result would be 1, 1, 1. Zero, 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 which you are absolutely right. That's a seven. So the result will be actually be seven. Are we okay? We don't care about the result. When you're doing binary values, nobody cares about the result. They want the bit pattern. And I'll tell you why. Do you remember that you did this? You said uh, O stream. You said, you said O stream 
say file or o m uh, sorry o f stream not o stream you did f stream file whatever and then you write over here i o s and then you put column in then you say or i o s out and you keep going like that so what it's actually doing because there are so many flags that a file needs to know they want they don't want to pass a structure with 50 booleans in it instead they just send one uh, integer in and they say if third bit is true then it's for reading if the fourth bit is true then it's writing if the fifth bit is true it's left justified <laughs> If the right, so it's all like that. So when you set certain things, so when you say iOS in, I do not know what the values are, go print them out and see what the value of iOS in is. But let's say iOS in is this, and iOS out is this. So when you or them, it will be 0, 1, 1, so it knows that it's for in and for out. Okay? So that's why they order flags. Okay? Are we okay? And how it can be... So, and, and we'll, we'll go through all the things and we'll see exactly what happens. Okay? So, are we okay down to this point? Now, all these things are normal. Like, we know what not is, you know what and is, or is, right, justified, and... Right shift and left shift is right. We know all those things that those are simple. Exclusive or is an amazing thing. It's kind of basis of all encryption algorithms. And I'll tell you why. See that? That's why I, did, I wanted to do this in person because uh, this you cannot do on a computer. It's difficult. I had to write on a screen and, or have slides and I hate slides. So this is exclusive or, right? Right? So exclusive or, what does it say? It says if they are the same, it's false. If they are different, it's true. That's exclusive or. So or is o exclusive or is only true if the two are different. If, I, if you have a one and zero, that's true. If you have a zero and one, that's true. If you have two ones, that's false. If you have two zeros, that's false. Are we okay with this? This is exclusive or. So let's say I am, I will exclusive or four to C. So I'm gonna have four over here. So I'm gonna, have, uh, let's, uh, f six and E. Six and E is good. So. Um, I want to have something that 7 and D so I exclusive or sev, so I'll exclusive or to D I will so what is D? D is 1101 one, right and I exclusive or 7 to it which is 0 1 1 1 okay all right so what happens let's exclusive or it 1 1 Okay, so that's XOR. We are doing XOR. What is that? Right? So that's the result for exclusive OR, correct? And this was 7, correct? That we did, correct? Let's exclusive OR that to 7 again. So in here I'm going to put 0, 1, 1, 1, 7. Let's exclusive OR it. What's going to be the outcome? Go. Look at that, D. Right? So essentially, this becomes your data, and this becomes your encryption key. You exclusive or something to a value, the result gets encrypted. Then you exclusive or it again to the key, it unlocks it, that brings it back to the same thing. Okay? But 
it's not that simple. That's like, I just told you two plus two is four. Now let's send a, a, a spaceship to, the Mar to Mars. <laughs> so that, that's what it is. So, but that's the basics for it. Okay, and now I'm going to show you a very simple encryption, how they do it. So what they do is this. They get their bit pattern, so this is their bit pattern, right? First of all, it's a huge file. They get the chunk by chunk, and they, they get that many bits, and they encrypt that one as much. Hence, 64-bit encryption, 32-bit encryption. So it means the chunks they are getting is 32 bits, something like that. So they get this. They exclusive or it to the key. So they have the key that is the same size. They exclusive or it. They get a result. OK? Then they do a circular shift. They divide it by two. And they shift everything to right and bring the first one over here. So they push all the bits to one side bring that one over here, then they push all the bits to this side and bring the last bit over here. So now data is lost. It just shifts, right? Then they exclusive or it to key again. They get a result. Then they push that one one to that side, push this one one to this side, and put that one over there, put this one over here. Then they exclusive or it to key again. And the result over here will be an encrypted thing. That's a, the most simple type of encryption. The number, now be careful, if you do this too much, you're gonna get the, uh, the, the thing back. So if you, keep, if you keep doing the key, you're gonna get the same result back at the end. You should stop. You should know exactly how many times you're doing, so you do the exact same thing again to the encryption, encrypted code. So when you want to decrypt it, what you do is that you first shift this direction and that direction and switch and do the key and you do that exact opposite and you do it to the key and you get the results back. Okay? That's a very simple one. But you know how they actually do that? Like when you, when you want to make this an encryption that is mo much more difficult, it's something like this. So instead of having the data kept in an array, what they do is that they keep the data inside a cube, which means your bits are like this. So this is one array of bits, one 64-bit integer. OK? So and what they do, they do the same thing to here, then rotate. Do rotate. It's like a rubric's cube. But they remember what was the pattern that they did it. So the exact same thing happens to individuals like that, and it goes all the way through. And they do it like this, and they do it like this. So they not only mix the data of this integer with itself, but the values of that one to the tip of all the integers that is at the side. So you keep doing that again. Uh, again, the idea is simple, but coding it is a different story. But you can. Like if you actually sit for a month, you'll be able to do it. And that's, like, that's another type of encryption that you can do. And the more bits you have. So because of this fact, we know that there is no encryption that is unbreakable. <laughs> Everything is breakable. It's just a matter of time. So if the first encryption that I have with a computer that is for decryption takes approximately a billionth of a second to decrypt it. So that's, that means nothing. And as you add to the level of complexity, the time exponentially goes up. So all the codes can be broken, but it's going to take like, what, 3,000 years? Or let's make it simple. It takes five years. By the time you know what was the content of what you want to decrypt, <laughs> the data is not valid. You can have it. Probably it's, it's already open, right? So that's what encryption is. So I just gave you an idea of like what you can do with all the bitwise stuff. Apart from all that, so that's the... Uh, encryption that is done with exclusive or. So now we know uh, what these things are.
okay? The uh, basic bitwise operators. Now, how do we recognize what is the value of certain key, like certain bit? If I want to actually find out what is a bit value inside an integer, how do I, can I write a function for it? Like, write a... Okay? Um, uh, all right, it decided to say, I require no longer... I'm going to pause it. My apologies. So let's say I, let's say I, uh, I want to write a function, and the function that I want to write, I want to give it an integer value and a number, and that number tells me it's blank now. Okay, so I hope that it's actually recording all this. Uh, we'll see. So let's say I want to have a function. Like, so I want to have a function over here. That function, I, I can make it a Boolean because it's C++. If it was uh, C, I would have made it like an integer or something, right? So I can have something like a Boolean. And I'm going to say over here, call it bit. In here, I'm going to put an unsigned int value. And in here, I'm going to have um, int bit number. So if bit number over there is 1, it's going to tell me what is the value of the first bit. If the, or I can put it bit index and make it 0 to whatever. So whatever you want to do. I'm going to do bit number. If, how can I write a function like this? It's pretty simple. So what you do is this. So if I have a value over here, And I want to know 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's say what is the value of this bit, the tenth one, OK? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All I need to do is to get a value that has only that corresponding bit set to 1 and everything else 0. So if I have a value like this that is 1, and 0 all the way over here, and 0 all the way over here. If I and these two values, what's going to be the outcome? If the value over here is 1, the outcome will be 1, and 0, 0 here, and 0 here. Whatever it is, it's a non-zero value, correct? Correct? Are we OK with this? If this value is 0, and I add that one, what's going to happen? Everything 0, everything 0. They're all going to be 0, and this one will be 0 too, correct? So the value will be 0. So all I need to do is to create a, 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 an integer value who has only the bit that I want set to 1. How do I do this? Three seconds. It's very simple. First of all, what is the bit pattern of one? The first one is one, correct? So first I'll get that one. I'll get, so in here, uh, let's call this one uh, 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 I'm going to call it unsigned unsigned m set to 1, OK? But I want the, this 1 to go to the 10th one, correct? If I want the 1 to go to 10th one, how many times I have to shift it? Nine times. If you do 10, it's going to go to 11th, right? So all I need to do is this, left shift this one, to bit number minus 1. So now M will have the 1 in front of the thing. So all I need to do is to say return. Boo. Val. And M. 
and that's going to tell me if the, uh, the bit is on or not. Correct? Are you all good with this? Now if I told you, write a function that prints the bit pattern of, a, of, a, of any memory dump that you want to give it to it. All you need to do is to see what is the size of the memory. Get the size of the memory, multiply it by 8, that's the number of bits you have. And then, uh, one by one, you've got to go divide it by integers. The size of integer is 4, you've got to do 4 by 4. Or, and then call that function, put it in a loop, and add to the index and print the bo Boolean values. Okay? Then you're going to get the reverse pattern of what they had. You saw it last time in the in, on the computer when I did it. If you just print from right, then you print the right one first, therefore everything's going to be reversed, right? If you don't want it to be reversed, you have to first, first send the bit to left and then, you know, okay? So which means, uh, yeah, so it means you have, you have to see what is the size of the, like, like if it's 32 bits, you have to make sure you start from bit 32 and go backwards and print them one by one and you get the bit values out. Uh, yeah. That's that. And there is also one thing that I would like to tell you, and that's going to be it. Um, Is it there? Where did it go? Yeah, it's there. <laughs> Sorry, I need this. So, you can create a structure, like, let's say, because of this fact, you can have all your flags crunched into an integer. Let's say you have 16 different flags, okay, or uh, different size of integers, like if you want somebody's age how many bits you need to show someone's age? It's maximum 100, right? So 128 needs 7 bits, correct? So 7 bits is enough for you to hold somebody, somebody's... I don't think we have anybody who's older than 127 years, right? And if they are, I don't want to deal with them. <laughs> okay, so, if, so you, can, you can actually get a, 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 an integer and Divide that integer to pieces that you want. Like, for example, I want to, um, how many, uh, doesn't matter. So let's say I go over here, struct, OK? And in this structure of mine, whatever it is, flags, or whatever, OK? I want to have. The first, the first bit to be if the person is married or not. Okay? So you can actually create an unsigned. You call it unsigned. Un, unsigned. Let's say uh, married. You put two dots and you put one. It means the marriage, marriage status of that person is bit number one. Okay? Now I want to know number of children. Like how many children the person can have. You can have like, uh, what, like 20? I don't think it's going to be more than that, right? I don't know, 10? Let's say maximum is 10 for our application. So for uh, for 
16, I need 4 bits, right? So I'm going to say over here, unsigned number of children, and I'm going to put over here 4. So bit number 1 will be if it's married or not. Bit number 2, 3, 4, 5 will represent an integer that is number of children. So if you deal with number of children, you can simply put an integer in it. Like you can actually say flags, so you can say over here, so let's make this capitalized. So you can actually say flags, like say F, and you can say F dot uh, married set to one. It means the person is married. But you cannot put two over there. If you put your overflowing it, you're going to destroy the number of children. It's extremely low level. There are no checkings and stuff like that happening over there. You have, to be, you have to know what you're doing. And these are usually happening when you don't have enough space. Like you're, I don't know, writing uh, some uh, uh, information that you want to crunch it into a small space. If I wanted to have these things, I'm going to have an integer for that and an integer for this, or a Boolean for that and an integer for this, then it will grow. But with this one, I have 32 bits to play with it, or 64 bits, if I'm in a 64-bit system. And now I can say over here, f dot uh, number of children set to 8. And access it later on if I want to. So if you do not want to do it manually like that to see what the contents are, uh, C language allows you to actually create bit fields and say, I want this bit from here to here to be an integer with six bits for me, and here to here, like five bits for me, and so on and so forth. That's called bit fields, OK? That's it. Maybe you get a question like this. I don't know, something, do a left shift and right shift, but I'm not going to do any bit fields and stuff. So. Don't worry about bit fills, just keep it in your knowledge that you have it. But in final test, you may have a very, like a question that uh, maybe I'm going to ask you to, uh, uh, a very short answer, something like give me the, the value that I need to add to this one to see if the six bit is one or not. See if you can know how to left shift it and stuff like that. Very simple bitwise stuff. So whatever you hear, heard today, other than encryption and the bit fields, that's going to be uh, uh, in the final assessment, if there will be, the, if I have enough space for it. Are we okay? That's it. So that's that's those are the bits, and uh, we have nothing else. Let me stop it. Any questions on the on bits? Yes, go ahead. So you said that for multiplication and division, uh, there are left shift and right shift. Mm -hmm. What, 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 what is the procedure for? Uh, like 4 divided by 2. So uh, that's uh, the numbers are... The go to university and uh, take the course uh, microprocessor design. Then you'll see. They're all with ands and or, and gates and or gates. <laughs> How it happens behind the scene, uh, well, that's a completely different thing. Even simplest CPUs, they do stuff like that. So with simplest CPUs, you say store this at this so addition and and all the uh, regular arithmetic stuff are built in any CPU, uh, but if you are doing with floating points, then it goes to the parts that is, yeah. But but they are all built into the CPU. They are all uh, electronic design, so it's not something that I can tell you what happens over. Here. Okay, and I, I you can. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste your time. It's out, it's it's out of the scope of this class. When you go, if you take the microprocessor design, yeah, then yeah, sure. And, and you have to go to uh, computer engineering hardware division to do that. Even software, you don't do, deal with those things. That's Boolean algebra, pure Boolean algebra. OK. Any other thing? Any other question like that that I'm going to say I'm not going to answer? <laughs> oh, yeah. So let, uh, so the focus of what we are, let me just, um, 
I lost my mouse. Okay. So, uh, a final assessment. Uh, because it's on paper, I'm going to make the questions focused and small. So what you're going to have, I'm not going to ask you to write an application that um, goes through the numbers that you're going to, like the series of stuff that do. The, I'm going to tell you this is an array with this size. Do something uh, parallel in it. Like so a very simple focus question that you can do in four or five lines to tell me if you know that concept or not. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to write gigantic programs. You are doing it already in your uh, project and your workshop, so there is no place for it. I'll everything's going to be focused questions. And uh, you're allowed to bring one creep sheet, sheet with uh, uh, both sides, and you can write anything you want on it. I told you how to do it, right? That's that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, focused on the latest, not not what we tested you. Yeah, so it, I cannot say I'm not going to use a for loop because you learned it in IPC 144, right? <laughs> Although I can, I can say do, do, do this with the SDL library without a loop. That's one of the questions could be. But what I'm saying is that, yes, uh, I will use those as tools, not focus questions on those, if they are absolutely necessary to be used. Yes? You've ne in your high school, you've never written anything on paper? So, okay, so let me tell you what, how you, what you do. First of all, I'm not asking you to have a good handwriting because I don't have one, okay? So I'm just going to ask you to please uh, be as... Uh, short as possible in your answers. Okay, don't try to overdo it, because overdoing always screws, screws it up. If you write two statements that kind of tells me you know what you're dealing with, I'll give you the mark. It, again, it's a test. Tests, I'm very generous in marking it, because you cannot do much in a test. You have only two hours. I cannot ask a person to to draw a painting and, and like it's it's impossible for a programmer to demonstrate what what they do in a, in, our, in an hour and 50 minutes so you're not going to write full programs but i may give you like for example uh, a class and i'll tell you all the functions that you see are implemented already and they work perfectly add this function to that class so you only write one method for a class using all the facilities of the function of the class that you have okay simple as that um, when i give you the answer book i'm going to ask you to please answer your questions in one page only and write at the top which question is that so i'll give you a booklet so the i'm going to just give you a, a, a paper or two for your questions and then I'm going to give you a booklet, an exam booklet, that has like 10 pages. And I'm going to ask you to answer the questions in separate pages, which means question one, even if it's two lines, you use one page for it. Question, yeah, one page for one question. Oh, one page or more if it's needed, I understand. Like, you start in one page, it's not finished, you go to the next one, I understand, which is highly unlikely, but, okay, but... Uh, Please, if you see the answer to the question is like three lines, don't, don't say one, two, three, four. That's bad because unless you're very tidy, you can you separate them perfectly. Okay? If you want to get the answer this semester, because it's, uh, we, we, it's, it's very difficult to mark paper questions. Okay? Fairly. Uh, uh, do, not, do not, for heaven's sake, copy the question. I know what the question is. Just the answer. And believe it or not, everyone does that. Like when I give you that class and I say implement that method, they write the whole class 
and then write the question, answer. Don't do that. Just answer the question. Do not copy the, do not copy the question's text. Uh, I would do it in pencil, not pen. Okay? Many profs say do it in pen only. No, do it in pencil so you can actually be erasing it and fixing it. So it's a good idea to do that. And if you make a, if, if uh, when I'm actually, uh, so what I will do, I will simply scan everything and I have it in my computer and I give it to you, you can, if I make a mistake, you can still fix. So that takes away the problem of because it's pencil, they can change their answers. Okay, because it's all scanned, I can compare to the, what I had to see if actually you change it or not. But yeah, so uh, if something goes wrong, obviously you're gonna review it. And I think reviewing it is gonna be next semester, your final test. So next semester we're gonna have an ex this was before COVID. So we had an exam viewing day where you could actually, uh, we, when you would come to school and you would ask for your exam, and I would bring your exam and I'll give it to you. You review it in front of me, you say it's good, or you would say this is a mistake, this is a mistake, and I'll fix it for you. So one day will be exam viewing day. If they follow the same pre-COVID situation, that's, that's how it's going to happen. Okay? Anything else? Immediately, uh, it's... it's you have announcements for it that tells you exactly when it opens. And immediately after the due date is done, you have access to it. Actually, there was a mistake in one of them. You pointed to it, and I fixed that. Okay. Right? You didn't get my message? No? Okay. So, so check your answers for the quizzes, because I made them, and it, the answer was four. By mistake, I put one. And she caught it. She said that it is four, and you, you, the, the correct answer was one. So I fixed it, everybody got remarked. All those people who, so check your answers, make sure, check your quiz questions, make sure they're all correct. Pardon me? Okay, talk to me. First of all, two lowest marks are dropped. If you've done the other ones, don't worry. But if you have done, but if, but if, if you already missed two and this is the third one, then talk to me, I'll, I'll open it for you. So you can do it. Does that make sense? Of, of course you can't see it because you didn't do it. So I'll open it for you and you do it, then you'll see it. Are we talking about the same thing? Okay, so what I'm saying is that if you missed one quiz and the others are okay, don't worry. We dropped the two lowest mark. Therefore, the one that you didn't do won't count anyway. But if you want that quiz to be done to get its mark, then talk to me and I'll open it up for you. But take a look at the announcements, and the announcements say exactly which quiz comes up with. Every two days, one of them come up. Yeah. Anything else? So, will it be covering the material after the midterm? What? The final assessment. The final assessment is focused on whatever that was not covered in midterm. So, midterm was up to week five, right? So, this is six to till now. You will have true false questions. You're going to have fit in the blank questions. So I'll give you those questions. You're going to have those questions. Uh, and you're going to have small walkthroughs again, focus walkthroughs. And you're going to have uh, focus programming questions. OK? Pardon me? Huh? Walkthrough is debugging. Okay, anything else? Oh, I have to run. Okay. I have to.